in some ways, outside pack refing, or at least doing outside pack refing well, can be the most complicated referee position in roller derby. It's definitely the least straightforward and the position that's changed the most in the last few years. And because of those changes, there's a whole lot of misinformation around where it comes to refing from the outside. This presentation is going to cover the basics of outside pack refing. There is a whole lot more you can do, but if you're starting out, this will hopefully give you an idea of where to go and what to prioritize. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The date of this recording is July 18, 2014, and there have been no updates since the original presentation was released. Before I start, I need to give you a pair of disclaimers. First, I see a lot of variation in outside pack ref positioning in leagues around the world. A lot of them are very good at what they do, and their positioning could be just as valid as mine. So please, if you get asked to do something different, don't assume it's wrong. Just adapt. Adaptability is huge when it comes to outside pack refing, especially if you travel. The second disclaimer is a bit of do as I say, not as I do. Not to brag, but I've done a lot of refing at the top levels of our sport, and there are videos of me outside pack refing in ways I'm going to ask you not to do here. At those levels, you get certain game situations and you get to work with certain referees who can stretch and change their positioning without affecting their counterparts. It requires extraordinary officials, communication, and skating, and it is only done if the game is at a certain level to demand it. This is a presentation about the basics, not a how-to on how to outside pack ref Gotham versus Philly. Keep that in mind because Despite my warning, 99% of the time when I outside pack ref, even at the WFTDA playoff level, I'm doing it as I'm about to present it. Let's start with a bit of history. I think that by understanding how the position of outside pack ref has evolved, it'll help you figure out why it is the way it is now. In the beginning, there was skate and weight. Outside pack refs would start the runs at either turns two or four, some leagues at one and three, but that's more detail than we really need, and end it up on the opposite turn, and stop. And so if you started on turn two, you'd skate half a lap, stop on four, and wait for the pack to come back around. And if they didn't, you didn't do anything. During that time, it wasn't uncommon for leagues, especially older leagues, to not use outside pack refs at all. Or if they did, they would put in people who were possibly thought as not ready to officiate on the inside. I once saw a league that had their outside pack refs stationary on chairs. So times changed. Leagues started seeing the value of referees to the outside, possibly because some skaters were wise to what they could get away with, or possibly because officials realized that they were missing half of the track. Possibly both. So there was a desire to get more out of the outside pack refs, and the idea of fluid outside pack refing came about. The goal of the fluid OPR is pretty simple. Don't stop skating. The idea was to get two to three outside pack refs on the pack at all times. You'd pick up your run at the traditional skate and weight turn, at this point almost always turns two and four, 
and then as your run ended, skate past your stop point and try to aid the other outside pack rests before you had to turn around and reset. This is great in theory, and if you had the refs who could pull it off, great in practice. The problem is, is that it's really easy to skate too far and not reset in time. This tended to cause patterns to lapse and packs to be uncovered for sometimes laps at a time. Even with top-level officials, a sudden increase of pack speed could blow things apart. So, for lack of a better term, we now have Fluid OPR version 2. I'll go into the details later on, but version 2 took the ideas from the initial idea of fluid outside pack refing, but changed the emphasis from running long to starting early, and adding a couple of demarcation lines to keep things from getting out of control. This has been working much better since the initial idea of Fluid OPR, with the additional benefits of allowing outside pack refs of different skating skills to be able to work together, and short of a referee takeout, will still always provide coverage on the outside. History lesson over. Let's start at the beginning of a jam. As I've mentioned in the inside pack ref module, while the pivot line start seems antiquated, it still does crop up from time to time, so it still needs to be covered. The outside pack ref on the left is positioned to look straight ahead at the pack. Her primary responsibility is the front on calls that none of the other referees are going to see, such as multiplayer blocks. The middle outside pack ref, lined up on the pivot line opposite of the front inside pack ref, is going to look for false start penalties on the outside players, but is otherwise focused on the pack, looking for penalties as normal. The rightmost outside pack ref could assist with false starts by the jammers, but is mostly going to look for anything at the back of the pack before taking off to her reset position near turn 3. The jammer line start is now much more common and is now the dominant form of jam start in today's roller derby. In this case, the front, or furthest left outside pack ref, is still looking for multiplayer blocks, but moves in closer to the pack so as not to call them from 50 feet away. The middle outside pack ref is still looking for false starts, which is much more likely because of the very compressed nature of the blockers in the scrum start. And the right outside pack ref is still looking for penalties from the back. It is very, very tempting to bunch up the outside pack refs in these scenarios, but I'm not a fan of it. The reasoning for bunching is that if the middle outside pack ref sees there's no obvious false start, he can cheat up in front and get a better look at the pack, or have a rear outside pack ref take the jammer line, allowing the middle outside pack ref to cheat up. For me, the problem is twofold. First, the two outside pack refs in front now have virtually the same angle, and there's no real reason to duplicate that. The second is that the entire back end of the pack is now going to be neglected. And if the pack moves quickly, the back outside pack ref may get caught out of position when he tries to reset. If you're the middle outside pack ref and you want to get a more centralized view of the pack after the jam starts, I suggest going into position with your left leg loaded up, so as soon as the whistle blows, you can use that explosive power to jump right into the position you want to be once the jam starts. Now we're going to get into the heart of outside pack refing, which is the rotations. Now, instead of a hard stop point, there's an area where you can stop and a desired location to start from. Where you stop has more to do with your speed and endurance as a skater along with the speed of the pack. Remember, where you start is far more important than where you stop. Because you see more when you're in position early, and if you're late, you may find yourself playing catch-up before you even begin your run, and then you're concentrating on skating instead of refereeing. Here's an example of where to start and stop for either side of the track. The green area is the best place to start your run at. Starting from the yellow area is marginal, but better than the alternative of the orange or red zones. Stopping in the yellow zone is also marginal, but sometimes necessary. Especially if you're already too far behind the pack, or the pack is very fast. Stopping your run at the orange zone is a good idea, as long as you know you can get 
back to the green area in time. The red area should only be used in extreme circumstances, or if you really know what you're doing and absolutely know you can get back. If you watch top-level referees on WFTDA.TV, watch them when the pack goes really fast. While they may stop in the red zone on a regular basis, and keep in mind that these are refs at the top of their game. When that pack goes really fast, they'll stop in the yellow zone so they can reset and get to the green area and get the best view. If it helps, think of it like this. The more time you have to be in position before a pack arrives, the better you can deal with it, even if it's a racing pack. If it is a racing pack and you're not in position, you're spending time and energy trying to get back into position instead of watching the play. Obviously, we don't want this taken to an extreme or we'd be back in the old skate and wait days, but this is why the emphasis is on getting to the start early. So how does the handoff between outside pack refs work? Here's an example. Here's the jam start. So what's happening here is that OPR 1 and 2 are staying roughly in their positions as the pack moves forward. And OPR 3 is now hightailing it back to turn 3 to await pickup. Since the outside is a longer distance to travel than the track the skaters use, it's natural for OPRs 1 and 2 to start falling a bit behind. This is why we have three outside pack refs. OPR 1 has gone from the front extreme of the pack to just the front, and OPR 2 has moved to the back, both of them closely mirroring the position of the inside pack refs. OPR 3 is almost ready to make her transition. Even if the pack is slow, you should start thinking of moving to these positions as you make your way around the track, or you'll find yourself inadvertently doubling up and missing coverage. If you don't, this is what happens. OPR2 has stopped at a decent spot, and as much as she would want to cover the missing area, is making the correct choice to stop and reset. OPR1, because of the slow pack, neglected to move more to the center and back of the pack, and now half of the pack has no outside coverage. And now back to the correct rotation. OPR2 has now ceased skating forward as the pack has passed her, and should be ready to, if not already on her way, back to her starting area. OPR1 is now covering the pack, and OPR3 is skating ahead in the perfect position for multiplayer blocks. In fact, it's close to a mirror of their jam start positions. And as the pack works its way back to the other side, the same transition occurs. And that's the basics of the outside pack ref rotation. The more you do it, the more of a feel you'll get for the position and the game, both in general and the one at hand. And the better you will be at determining where you stop on the green, yellow, orange, red continuum. Like most sports, the diagrams are easy. Putting it into practice is hard, but lots of fun. There is actually a whole lot more to know before being ready for a game, but since this presentation is already as long as the other positioning modules, we're going to take a break here. If you're just starting to learn outside pack refing, go ahead and take a break yourself and get to know the rotation in real life. Once you get that rotation down, go to the next outside pack ref module where I'll go over things you need to know, such as when to break this rotation we just went over. I'd like to thank Preflash Gordon and Dolph Lensgren for permission to use their photographs in this module. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site but please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.